You're one of the co-founders of Colossus, which recently announced that they de-extincted a dire wolf, and yeah. now you're working on the woolly mammoth. Yeah. Do you really think we're going to bring back like a woolly mammoth, or how? Because like the difference between an elephant and a woolly mammoth might be like a million base pairs. Yeah. So h- how do you think about what is the ki- how do we think about the kind of thing we're actually bringing back? Yeah. Well, so so I think uh, I think people get worked up about uh, you know whether we whether we are trying to bring back or have already or will ever bring back a new species. Um, and, and I think of it, if you think of it rather than as a natural thing that we're trying to do, but as a, a synthetic biology with goals that have potential societal, and people also get worked up as to whether this could possibly benefit society in any way. You know, can we really, um, you know, fix an environment uh, to suit humans or fix the global carbon to suit humans? And the answer is we don't know, but it's worth a try, isn't it? Because it could be very cost effective. Um, and the other thing, the other aspect of it is there's a whole discipline within synthetic biology of asking what's the minimum, right? And so people often phrase it into what's the maximum, you know, like what, what can we do? And I'm interested in both, but you know, it's like, oh yes, there's a millions of difference between um, mammoths and elephants. There are millions of differences between elephant one and elephant two within, within Asian elephants and between Asians and African. But not all of those are definitive in terms of what we would normally call them, you know, uh, you know how we would normally classify them, how, what their functionality would be in an ecosystem, right? And so, so there's this exercise that people do, and, and we've done it, for example, with developmental biology. What's the minimum number of transcription factors it takes to make a neuron from a, a pluripotent stem cell, mm. right? What's the minimum number of base pairs it takes to make something that will replicate mm. to something that uh, you know was done in mycoplasma originally? Yeah. Um, and these are these, in a way, these are more interesting than can we make a perfect copy of something, right? It's can we make what's the minimum things we have to do to make it completely functionally or even functionally in a particular category, right? Mm-hmm. How do we make it bigger? We learn the rules for how to make things bigger, um, how to make things replicate faster, how to, you know, how to use new materials, et cetera. So I think what the dire wolf, we clearly didn't make an exact copy of a dire wolf, but the diff- but it helped illustrate kind of educated people around the world that the that what is the difference between a wolf, a gray wolf and a dire wolf, right? Because, you know, dire wolves, they're, they're big. Maybe they have a particular coloration. You know, a, you know the head, head components tend to be bigger than the, than the leg components. Um, and so how many, how many genes do you need to do that? Maybe this was dire wolf, you know, 2.0, and we're going to go for, go for 3.0 and in, in, in successive approximation. And we might want to develop the technology for making an exact copy of something. Because then we can, especially being able to make a hundred variations on an exact copy. Because then you, then there won't be any argument about whether you could make a dire wolf. It's a matter of whether what what should you make and what would be most beneficial for the species that you're making, for the environment it lives in, and for humans. Does this teach us something interesting about phenotypes, which you think require are downstream from many genes? are in fact modifiable by very few changes. Basically, could we do this to other species or to other things you might care about, like intelligence, where you might think like, oh, there's, there must be thousands of genes that are relevant, but right. there's like a 20 edits you need to make really to be in a totally different ballgame. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's you're hitting on a very interesting uh, question, and it's related to, you know, what's the minimum? So for example, you almost uh, said it, which was, you know, for take a, a very multigenic trait right. in humans, like height is something that's it's probably the most uh, well-studied one, simply because no matter what gene you're, no matter what medical condition you're studying, you collect information on height and weight and things like that. Anyway, they tracked it down to on the order of 10,000 genes, uh, of which we have 20,000 protein yeah. coding genes, and some of them are RNA coding genes. And and they each have a tiny mm-hmm. influence on, on height. Um, but if you take uh, growth hormone, a somatotropin, uh, that you have 
extreme examples where you'll get extremely low, small stature and extremely high stature do that one alone. Mm. And in fact, it's used clinically as mm. well uh, in, for seven different uh, uh, medical um, treatments. So, so that's a perfect example of how, how much we can minimize something sometimes called reductionism. Yeah. Reductionism isn't all bad. Um, sometimes it helps us bring a product into medicine. Sometimes it helps us understand or build a tool chest or a, uh, a module that we can right. use in other cases and translate it to other species. Yeah. So you're, you hit on it just right, is, is that not everything will translate, but we start accumulating these widgets, it's kind of like all the electronic widgets that we accumulate right. over time, that if you just want to slap it into the next um, circuit, you might be able to. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.